Well, hello and welcome to Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Here we are on part three of the V8 Lamborghini story. And we're looking at this car this time round, the Yalpa or Halpa. The letter J doesn't exist in Italian officially, so it's quite difficult to know exactly how to pronounce it. I'm sure lots of people can correct me and tell me how wrong I was. But we're going to be setting this car up. We've done a lot of work on this car, suspension-wise, brakes-wise. And then we're going to be giving this car a run and seeing why it's different from the other two. So there we go. Let's try it and see. Lamborghini was struggling around about 1980. The factory was in a pretty awful financial state and the car, ironically, that was helping them the most was uh, the very, very exotic Countach. It became actually their bread and butter car. And uh, cleverly, they decided to resurrect the Silhouette project from the late 70s. And they realized if they gave it a, a warm over styling wise uh, and gave it a new name, they could market it as a, a 1980s car to help uh, alongside the Countach. And that car became the Halper. And it's got the Athon wheels, which was a styling exercise around about 1980-81 that Bertone did. A stunning looking car with these great wheels, which they copied and pasted onto the Halper, along with larger wheel arches and gave it a, a larger 3.5 litre engine as well. But it was no more powerful. And one of the reasons why they did that was to make sure that the gap between the American spec cars, because quite a few of them were sold in the States between 1981 and 88 when they finished, to make sure that the American spec cars were not really low on power compared to the Euro spec cars. So they increased the capacity of the engine and then detuned the engine so that it wasn't that different for the emissions strict cars and the European spec cars with the less stringent emissions. Quite a clever trick on Lamborghini's part. And uh, the helpers sold quite well. They made 410 of them around and allegedly 35 right hand drive. So using the usual metrics of sort of roughly 10% of production as right hand drive. And they sold well. It was a good car, open air motoring, that lovely V8 burble, very cubist sort of dashboard layout. But yeah, a good effort on Lamborghini's part at the time. Well, here we are out on the road in uh, our third Bambino Lamborghini. Uh, it's quite interesting because um, the, the, the way manufacturers juggled figures and worked things and manipulated things uh, around the 60s and 70s and 80s before legislation sort of pinned them down to uh, being open and accurate, more to the point, um, all sorts of numbers were bandied around for things and this car is no exception. Uh, in spite of the fact it's got a, a substantially bigger engine than the previous uh, Uraco, the, three, the P300 and the Silhouette, they quote uh, power and torque figures which are not dissimilar. In fact, the difference between the two, in spite of sort of 15% increase in capacity, are about three brake horsepower or something ridiculous like that, from around 252 to 255. So not worth talking about at all. You get more than that in difference on engines on the production line. Um, so why? Why is this? Well, a lot of it's to do with the US market. Um, they had to detune cars in the 1980s. Ferrari had similar problems. That's why the Ferrari 308 and the Boxer both went through the pain of having to be detuned and eventually onto fuel injection. And because Ferrari um, had struggled with so much uh, power loss, they brought in the four valve um, engines in the the uh, 308 Quattro Valvole in 1981, and then the Testa Rossa in 1984, I think, from memory. Um, so there was all sorts of juggling around. Uh, catalysts were like shoving a tennis ball up the exhaust in terms of uh, robbing an engine of power. And uh, cars like this, um, I mean, this is, this is quoted as being a lot heavier than the Silhouette. Sort of, I mean, I mean a lot, like 20%. There's no rationale for that whatsoever. Yes, it's got a more lumpy dashboard and bigger energy absorbing bumpers and wider wheels, but no, it's not really, doesn't really, doesn't really scan that. There may be a hundred kilo difference in the real world. 
but it does mean all this means that the helper isn't actually that much faster than the silhouette or the three litre Uraco, um, which is hardly a criticism because it's an entry level classic car and it was Lamborghini's sort of staple um, entry level car and it would still do 160 miles an hour which was very good in the 1980s very good very credible but the joy of this engine is in some ways the noise now I know noise is a very moot point some people like uh, the traditional V8 burble they like this one and some prefer the uh, the racing car-esque noise of uh, what's called a flat plane crank V8 so there are two distinct types of V8 engine the uh, traditional American um, power unit type model of having a, um, the crank pins staggered at 90 degrees so you get a, um, a very acoustically lumpy engine um, that means to say cylinders are, are um, pulling in uh, their, their lump of air in different relationships to each other which gives it that V8 burble whereas a flat plane crank V8 is essentially two four-cylinder engines stuck together and you get a more constant noise because um, the firing pulses aren't as staggered but um, does that make a difference yes it does um, the flat plane crank engines like the Cosworth Formula One engine the DFV that dominated Formula One for all those years uh, has almost a sort of four-cylinder sound up to about 5,500 rpm then you hear bits of V8 creeping in whereas this just sounds like a V8 and is none the worse for that oh yes and it's all there it doesn't really matter to the nearest 10 brake horsepower <coughs> whether it's this or whether it's that the fact is it still sounds absolutely glorious give me this over a, a Ferrari 308 engine I'm afraid this wins Mamma mia! And I have to say, the job that uh, Marcus did on the brakes and suspension rebuilding this are really really spectacular it's sitting on the road absolutely beautifully and the engine is all there <laughs> i love the silhouette but this car is also great it's a little bit fluffy um, on uh, mid-range so we're going to have to have a look at that and just see if we can we can sort that out maybe a bit of carburation these modern fuels do cause problems like this because they um, the characteristics have changed the the formulae have changed the benzene content uh, of course we we don't mention the l word lead um, but uh, it does make a difference to how carburettors in particular uh, respond to this because they have no means of self-adjusting or self-regulating like an engine management system so we are going to have to just tweak some of the jetting around the mid-range there but um, oh. in fact it's getting better with use um, but we will need to do it but in the meantime it still goes as well when the pedals to the metal. Woo! Wonderful. Well, we 
we've uh, we've done some work on the jetting on the carbs and uh, it's so tricky these days as I mentioned before with with fuel uh, changing it's like a moving feast uh, really to get them right but um, we think we've done it so the problem was that when you floor the throttle sort of mid-range it bogged down for a split second uh, and then uh, would pick up again so let's just give it another shot and see how we're getting on it's all warmed through again we're back up to speed let's see how we get on that's better yes immediate response as it should be eight throttles snapping open and away you go very happy well that concludes part three of our Lamborghini V8 journey I uh, hope you've enjoyed uh, the videos and um, please remember to subscribe and like and share and we'll be back with something else very soon